Hello, everyone. Um, so welcome to my first open source graphic class. Um, I'm Boris Brazilian. I'm working uh, for Collabora for nine months now. And today I'm going to teach you um, how GPUs work. Uh, actually, no. I'm not in a position where I can pretend teaching you uh, how a GPU works because I only started working on GPUs like six months ago. And um, yeah, what I'll do is instead share my understanding of uh, these things. And of course, if I'm wrong, don't hesitate to interrupt me and, and correct me. Um, and also, don't trust, don't blindly trust everything that's written in those slides. If you have to use that, then go check on your own and make sure it's, it's correct. Um, so what is this talk about? Uh, maybe I should first start by, by telling you what it's not about. It's definitely not about teaching you how to use a graphics API. So no OpenGL, no Vulkan there. Um, it's also not about teaching you how to develop a driver. Both of those things would take much more than 40 minutes. So what I'm trying to do here is trying to explain how GPUs work, uh, how to interact with the GPU from the software stack, and what the uh, Linux soft, uh, GPU stack looks like. But before we uh, go look at the software stack, let's first have a look at what a GPU does. So basically, a GPU is here to display 3D contents. You'll pass several things to, to the GPU, like um, the model you want to display on the scene, the textures you want to apply to those models, some extra information, like the transformation you, you want to apply to those models, and then you put that to the GPU, and you get a nice juice box. Um, but it's in the middle, it's like kind of a black box. Actually, it's a blue box here, but it's the same thing. Um, so let's have a look at what's inside this black box. We actually have two main stages. The first one is uh, the geometry stage, and it's where the coordinates you will pass to the GPU will be transformed into a geometric shape and split into basic primitives. So here you can see that we uh, chose triangles, but it can be quads or it can be lines or whatever. And then this geometric shape is passed to the rasterizer stage, which is also passed textures or multiple textures. And those textures will be applied to your geometric shape. And you end up with some 3D content you can display on the screen. So of course, that one is pretty basic. But when you look at a game, you actually have hundreds of models with complex textures, um, and those models are much, much more complicated than cubes. So yeah, that's what a GPU does. Um, so let's have a look, at, have a closer look at both those geometry, geometry stage and, and rasterized stage. The geometry uh, stage is here to turn those vertices, those coordinates, into this geometric uh, shape you want to, to uh, render. The, ver the first step is passing those vertices to what we call a vertex shader. It's part of the pipeline, which is programmable, so the user will be able to define how those vertices will be uh, transformed. So you have some basic transformation, which happen almost all, of the, all, all, all the time, like putting the model in, in some complex scenes, or placing the camera somewhere in the scene, or uh, doing some kind of projection. And then you have some things that are completely application dependent. So you can do any kind of transformation on those vertices uh, that you want, because it's completely programmable. Then you have two uh, stages which are optional. So depending on your GPU, it will be supported or not. And those are the geometry and tessellation shaders. Um, actually, I didn't um, put any diagram on those because 
I don't really understand how they work exactly, but the idea is that based on a set of vertices, you will be able to generate new ones. And so that instead of passing a thousand or miles of vertices, you will be able to generate them from the ones you already passed. So it saves some memory bandwidth when, when you use uh, those tricks. Then we uh, go through some fixed uh, function steps. The next one after the uh, geometry and test addition shaders are the primitive assembly. So it's about taking all the co coordinates and, and linking them so that you can uh, form uh, basic primitives. Here we are uh, creating triangles. And so you have a cube, six faces, 12 triangles. Next step is about um, clipping. So the object you uh, want to render might not be completely inside the scene. So you will, be, you will have to move it uh, to, to one of the, the side of the, the, um, the scene. And so this step might generate new vertices and then new triangles. Then you go through the back face tooling. Uh, this part is about optimizing the rendering. So everything that's not visible should be hidden. And so you will, during this phase, drop some of the shapes, some of the basic primitives. So if you look at this diagram, you'll see that um, all the faces that we don't see, we just discard them. And finally, you will have to place this shape, this shape um, inside the window you want to display it in. So you will have to scale the shape and then um, move it where you want to, to have it displayed. So that's how you end up with your uh, geometric shape. Then what happens is that the, the, um, the GPU passes this shape to the next stage, which is called the rasterizer stage. And here it's all about filling pixels with some colors. So the first step is um, trying to determine which pixels are covered with all, by all of those simple primitives. So you will pick, pick one triangle, then put it on the, the pixel grid, and then determine which pixels are covered. Once you have done that, so the triangle setup, you will uh, try to fill all of those pixels with some colors. And those colors are usually taken from a texture, but it can also be um, a predefined color. And finally, once you have done that, what you will do is look at what the, pix the previous pixel was and then determine what the final uh, pixel value, value will be. So, if you add a triangle on top of another triangle and the, the new triangle is uh, above the, the old one, then it will completely hide the old pixel. Or if you determine that the, 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 um, the triangle is partly tra transparent, then you will have, you'll have to do some blending. But the basic idea is that the merging stage is here to determine what's the final color you will have displayed on your, on your screen. So that's basically it. You have this complex di display pipeline, and you end up with um, something like that that we've seen on the first slide. So that's great. Now let's look at what's actually inside a GPU, hardware-wise, hardware I mean. Um, so we've seen that in the pipeline, we have some fixed functions and some programmable function. The fixed functions are all in red in this diagram, and you will have the texture units, the triangle setup, the rasterizers, the blending units, and a lot more. Basically, everything that takes a lot of time is optimized and, and put it in fixed functions. And then you have the programmable parts, which are called shader cores. And inside those shader cores, you actually have one or multiple ALUs, um, and those are where all the processing happens inside the GPU. And next to those cores, you also have some um, blocks that are here to optimize things, like caches, because you, don't, you want to hide the memory latency. 
or a scheduler because you want to parallelize a lot of things but still don't add too, too much cores. But the basic idea be behind um, GPU processing is going massively parallel. And why do we want that? We want that because when you think about it, you have a lot of vertices. When you think about a game, you have a lot of uh, models. The scene can contain um, like 1,000, 1 million models. Each model contains a lot of vertices. And then when you want to display the final coral, you think about the resolutions like uh, 1080p uh, or even 4K now. And when you think about it, you just have a huge amount of things to, to process. And luckily, all of those things can be processed completely independently. So it really calls for uh, parallelization here. Um, and the last thing is that we want things to be rendered in a decent amount of time. So we can't just serialize things. We have to do things as fast as possible. So how, would, how do we do that? The first trick is using CMD. So CMD is you take a single instruction and then you apply it to multiple data. In the case of GPUs, that means that you will take a single instruction and you will apply it to multiple vertices or multiple uh, fragments. Another way to optimize things is to use fixed function units. So we've seen that we have a lot of them in GPUs. And the last thing is putting a lot of cores. But when you put a lot of cores, that means that you have somehow to reduce the size of each core. And if you want to reduce the size of each core, that means that you, they have to be as dumb as possible. So no fancy stuff like we find in CPUs, out of order execution, smart prefecture, branch predictors, we don't have that in GPUs. Or not as smart as we have in, in CPUs at least. So yeah, we have a solution. CMD, a lot of cores, and that's perfect. Well, actually, actually it's not, because it doesn't work in practice. <laughs> um, yeah, just two problems that we have, and I guess there are many more than that. Um, the first one is when you want to access memory, you have to go to the, through the memory bus, and usually it takes like 100 cycles or even 1,000 cycles. And that means that during that time, you can't execute anything else. You have to wait. So we have to somehow hide the latency that is incurred by all memory accesses. We have a solution for that. I mean, in CPUs, you have a lot of caches, and that works great because you want to access some piece of memory, you access a bit more, and then you put it in the cache, and then the next access, which is close to it, will uh, just hit the cache, and you get the memory almost instantly. But when you do that in GPUs, that means that you have to add caches in all the cores, and then L2 caches, and, and so on. And as I said, we try to not use too much space, not use too much gates. So the other approach is to uh, instead use multi-threading. That is, you will try to prepare a lot of things to do, pack all the fragments, pack all the uh, vertices, and then put them on hold until one of the threads is executed and is blocked because it needs to do a memory access. When that happens, then the GPU just put this block on hold, put the thread, this thread on hold, and then pick another one to execute it. And since you have a lot of them waiting in parallel, then you can somehow hide this latency because you have a lot of things to do in the meantime. So that's, that works great. Um, the other approach to uh, help optimize the, the parallelization is CMD. But with CMD, if you want to use the, the GPU efficiently, that means yeah, you have to keep all the ALUs busy as much as possible. And that means that when you execute a, a shader, you have to avoid penetrable branches. Because if some of the uh, fragments or uh, vertices 
goes in one branch and the other goes, goes in, 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 the, in the other branch. That means that part of the alias are uh, idle for some time. So you have to find a way to pack all uh, those things uh, so that you get a good use of, of your GPU. So that's, that, those are some complexities you have to deal with and the hardware can help with that, but you also have to deal with that from a software point of view. And that's why GPU compilers are so complex because you have to think about all those uh, things when you want to optimize code for, for a GPU. So that's it about the hardware. Now let's have a look at uh, how you actually interact with this hardware from a software point of view. Um, the, the CPU is here to deal with uh, all the apps which are running on, on a machine, but it's also here to um, ask the GPU to do something. And when it asks the GPU to do something, it has to pass a lot of data, think about vertices. Uh, think about all the uh, textures and, and all the stuff that actually uh, represent a huge amount of, of uh, data. So how do we do that? Well, the simplest way is to just put everything in memory, then tell the GPU, okay, everything you need to execute, this is in memory at this position. And go, do what you have to do. And let me know when you're done. And that's basically how it works. What you have is what we usually call a command stream. And this command stream contains a few uh, blocks. Each block is describing a specific operation. Like, for example, if you have a vertex shader, usually you have a vertex descriptor. And then it points to another block of memory which contains all the vertices. And also another block which contains the bytecode for this shader. And you have the same thing for the fragment. And you also have other kind of job with, which I don't describe it, but it's highly uh, GPU dependent. So yeah, the driver basically has to describe that and pass this piece of memory to, to the GPU. Great. So we have a good idea of, of how uh, we interact with GPU, what's inside the GPU, and so on. Now let's have a look at um, the graphics stack. When you look at the graphics stack, you actually have several components. The first one is the application. This application, it interacts with um, well-known graphics API. You have several of them. Uh, OpenGL is probably the, the most well-known one. Uh, you have Direct3D for uh, Windows applications. And you also have Vulkan, which is quite new and probably uh, taking over uh, OpenGL uh, at some point. And then um, behind those APIs, you actually have drivers. Those drivers are split in two pieces, one which is running in the space and one which is running in the space. But let's first have a look at the uh, graphics API. So what, why, do we need, why do we need that? When you look back at the graphics pipeline, and at the, the common string stuff, you can imagine how complex it is to um, actually get it right for a specific hardware. So what those graphics API do is abstract those hardware uh, specificities. And yeah, you might have a, this choice. It really depends on your hardware. So if you use Intel GPUs, you can use OpenGL, Vulkan, and also even uh, directory now thanks to the uh, uh, MESA drivers. Um, and as I said before, part of the pipeline is uh, programmable, and, and so you have to somehow describe what you do in, in those shaders. So what this part is actually done in separate language, which is called GLSL or HLSL. And when the user space application wants to pass this program to uh, the GPU, it actually has to pass it to first to the graphics API. The driver has to compile it in some uh, other specific bytecode, and then it can pass it to the GPU through the command stream. A 
few words about the main ones actually in the in the open source, in the open source space. So we basically have the choice between OpenGL, which is the old API, and Vulkan. And they actually have two uh, different approaches. OpenGL is about hiding as much as possible the complexity about what's happening in the GPU. And that works pretty good. I mean, when you want to develop a 3D app, you do it in OpenGL and rather simple. On the other hand, that means that the driver has to be to do some guessing about what the user wants to do if it wants to optimize things. While Vulkan tries to expose as much as possible the hardware complexity so that um, the user can take the best decision for its specific workload. And of course, when you write a Vulkan application, it's likely to be a bit more complex, but on the other end, it's likely to be much more efficient because you get full control over the, the, the display pipe, the, the GPU pipeline. So yeah, if you have the choice, I guess it's a pretty good idea to actually tr try writing application in Vulkan. There are two reasons to, la to that. The first one is that it will probably uh, worry better than an OpenGL app. And the second one is that you will actually learn about how GPU works internally. And that, that's a good thing to understand how things work because then you can take the appropriate decisions. So now let's move on and, and go to the uh, drivers. The drivers are quite complex. And that has to do with the GPU complexity actually. Um, so we could have put drivers directly inside the kernel, but since they are complex and actually not all the code needs to run in privileged context, it's actually better to move the part that can be in user space into the user space, and then have the part that deals with hardware interaction in kernel kind of space. And also the beginning in user space is much, much easier. And the last thing, but I'm not sure it's a good reason, is that when you put something in your space, you don't have all, all those uh, licensing issues. And that's probably a good reason for all closed source drivers to, to, deal, to deal with it, to deal uh, with uh, drivers like that. So let's have a look at what's inside a kernel driver. Um, the kernel driver is responsible for three things. Memory management, so allocating buffers, freeing buffers, passing buffers, and, and so on. It's also responsible for uh, taking a common stream, executing, executing it, and also um, doing the multiplexing when you have several applications accessing the GPU. So it's also here to schedule all the common stream it has received. And finally, it's here to uh, signal when a GPU is, the GPU is done executing the command stream. For all open source uh, user space drivers, you have a kernel space driver which is normally in mainline. So usually it's in drivers, GPU, DRAM. And for, for closed source drivers, we don't have kernel drivers in mainline, simply because it's, it's a policy that GRAM maintainers want to, want, want to enforce. They want to have user space drivers which are open source before merging kind of space drivers. And that actually makes sense because we want to push for uh, an whole open source solution. So that was for the kind of space driver. Uh, what about the user space driver? So that one is the most complex one. I mean, it's here to implement the uh, graphics API. It's here to um, compile shaders, so all the compiler complexity is, is put in user space. It's also here to uh, create the command streams, pass them to, go to the kernel, do the synchronization with, with the kernel space drivers. Um, and it's also here to interface with the window system, windowing system manager. So all the interaction between your uh, Wayland compositor and your GPU is also done in, in the user space driver. 
Um, yeah. Um, so we have a solution for uh, open source drivers in, in Linux, which is called Mesa. Um, and depending on the API you want to implement in this library, in this uh, um, middleware, you will have two different approaches. The one for GL is uh, try to abstract the GL calls and then define a standard driver interface and then pass all the calls to all the, the calls to the specific driver. And for Vulkan, actually it doesn't work like that because Kronos has its own driver loader and own a driver abstraction layer. So all all that's implemented in Mesa for Vulkan drivers are actually just the, the drivers and, and nothing uh, abstracted for, for the API itself. Um, and then for code sharing, they just use libs. So a few helpers which help um, factorizing some code, but that, that's all. There is no abstraction. Regarding the, the implementation of drivers, uh, you actually have several choices. I won't detail the uh, pre-gallium one because it's not supposed to be used anymore. <laughs> but there was a specific interface which drivers were implementing, implementing uh, before gallium. So gallium is about trying to abstract all the uh, state matching specificities and make the driver only deal with hardware specificities. So what they do in, in uh, the Ganyam abstraction is that they take calls from a specific API. It can be OpenGL, it can be Direct 3D, or there are also other state trackers. They transform that in some kind of uh, generic calls, and then they pass the, the call to the, the specific driver. And depending on your hardware, it will go through a different driver. So if you have a GL call and only have a, uh, a Mali GPU on your platform, then it will go to the Penforce driver and pass it to the uh, kernel driver uh, counterpart, and so on. So that's how the abstraction is done in, inside Mesa. For Vulkan drivers, it's a bit more complicated. Um, you actually have no abstraction at all. That means that currently drivers are kind of duplicating a lot of code, even if part of it is put in some libraries, common libraries. Most of the code, I think, could be shared a bit more. But the idea is that the layer between uh, the graphics API is, and the uh, actual driver is much, much thinner than with uh, Gallium. And the part of the reason why it is done like that is because you don't have a state matching anymore in, in Vulkan. So you don't have to deal with all the state tracker thing that uh, is done in, inside Gallium. Or at least that's, that's my understanding. So yeah, we've, that was pretty quick overview. Um, I won't pretend you will be able to develop drivers uh, based on that, but that gives a pretty good idea of um, where to look at and, and how PCs are interacting with each other. Keep in mind that GPU topic is, is super vast and you won't be able to get a grasp on, 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 on all those concepts in like two weeks. It's, at least for me, it's not, it's not possible. So if you want to start developing a, a GPU driver, what you should do instead is focus on a specific feature or focus on a specific bug and go dig, go dig in, into, into this direction and keep digging until you actually understand the underlying co co concepts. And the most important thing is don't give up. Keep, keep uh, reading stuff about GPUs and, 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 and keep learning about, about that. Um, a few useful things if you want to learn about GPUs. Uh, there are quite a good blog post about that, how GPUs work. 
And of course, uh, you can search in Google and you'll, fill, you'll find plenty of them. Also, if you want to dig into the Mesa code, source code, you should probably have a look at the documentation because the source tree is a bit hard to follow. So yeah, you should probably have a look at that. And the Duram subsystem, so the, the kernel side of things, is pretty well documented as well. So yeah, you should probably have a look too. And that's all for now. I hope you were able to understand a few things. And if you have any questions, maybe I can answer them. Is anyone working on the uh, PowerVR open source or slash free software driver? Because I know that the other GPUs have now a free software driver, yeah. which is the PowerVR. I'm pretty sure no one is working on that. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately. And I heard that the, the architecture of the GPU itself is quite hard to, to deal with. And so it doesn't really fit in, in the model we have right now, the modeling we have right now in, in Mesa. So, no. Hi there. Um, so I was wondering, uh, when you want to do general purpose uh, computation on a GPU, um, do you know if there are any like uh, significant like changes to the hardware or architecture or anything that needs to happen to make that possible, or is it just is it just a case of using the like the graphics pipeline in a more in like a non graphical context kind of thing? I guess the, the compiler help can help optimizing things for your specific workload. So it has to do with uh, the driver side of things. The, the, the Mesa driver will try to optimize some specific workload uh, for, uh, I guess you're talking about OpenCL or this sort yeah, of yeah, thing. Yeah. Just, yeah, general purpose GPU. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's the, the responsibility of the, the driver to try to optimize something. OK, thank you. And you have some tools to, to help you with that, especially in Mesa. You have the Near compiler, which is helping a lot with all kind of compiler optimizations. So yeah, Thanks. you have some tools. No more questions? So the question is, what, what's the open seal support in Mesa? Um, I'm not so sure about that, but I think Clover is about supporting open seal in Mesa. And so I guess there, there's a state tracker dedicated to, to open seal inside Mesa. Yeah. Not entirely sure, but I think this is the case. Is uh, Vulkan only working with one specific driver, uh, slide 32? Sorry? On slide 32. <laughs> 31. Sorry. <laughs> Vulkan is only MSM driver or? It's, it's the Qualcomm one. So Fridrono is the uh, open source driver, and MSM is the kernel side of, of the open source driver. Can you shortly explain what a state tracker does? What is it? So a state tracker is about maintaining the state of the graphics API. If you look at how OpenGL works, it's actually a huge, big, uh, a huge state machine. And so every time you do an operation, then it changes the state. And the state tracker is here to help you keep track of that. So that drivers only focus on executing things and nothing else. 
And so you can have the same state tracker for all drivers. And that's actually what Gallium is designed for, factorizing all those state trackers and making them come on to, um, to all GPU drivers. Thanks. No more questions? There is one. Oh. Okay. Thank you.